You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So uh, today, what we're going to do, we're going to start off, first of all, with the uh, Mark Murphy takes five thing or whatever, because um, there's some interesting nuggets in there. One thing that I just completely forgot to cover, which is a pretty exciting little tidbit, um, and then just kind of his thoughts on some of the, the rule changes and whatnot, and I want to kind of go through that. By the way, anybody that's wondering, you know, I mentioned that I was going to be looking at linebackers, and then I moved on to running backs and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, when we're going to cover those, talk about those. I want to talk about linebacker and what I saw, especially while it's fresh. However, I only want to do this one more time. I want to do one more official. Here is the stance, et cetera, et cetera, of these prospects. But there's one important thing we cannot move forward without, and that is Dane Brugler's The Beast Draft Guide. That is probably the best draft guide that you can find. It's it's very, very insightful, a lot of things that you learn about the player um, on a personal level and what they wear and how they grew up and all this. It's so in-depth, and it really gives you a good picture of who these guys are. Um, I don't want to formulate my final opinions. I've kind of given it for linebacker, as you can see, but you know, I, I give myself the option to make adjustments or whatever. But um, that will be coming out on the 10th. Once that comes out, we're going full bore through all these positions again. uh, Final thoughts, etc. But until then, we're doing other stuff. So, and that's not to say we're not going to talk about the draft. It's just, you know, as far as going position by position, player by player, etc., etc. We're not doing that yet. So anyways, getting started with this Mervy Takes 5 thing. So I want to start off in paragraph two. He talks a little bit about the hip drop tackle. He, He... Starts off with the kickoff thing, but he says, I'll address that later. He says, other rules that were passed include banning the hip drop tackle, an extremely dangerous play where the attacker typically grabs the back of the runner's jersey and swings his legs into the legs of the runner. What I don't like about that last sentence is the word typically. If you don't like when people do that thing, then do something about that thing. Don't give me a broader rule that also includes the thing you don't like, but also is broadened out to things that maybe aren't as bad or maybe less defined. Why would, why would it be something, why would typically be involved in that? We banned a thing that sometimes includes this dangerous thing. Wait, wait a minute. It's like saying we took the swings out of the playground because sometimes kids stand up on the swings and do backflips and then break their necks. Like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Why, why don't you just tell kids they have to sit on the swings and not do backflips? Why are we throwing the swings out? Goes on to say, it may be hard for officials to see the infraction on the field, but passing the rule allows the league office to find players after the game. I mean, this this is this is rough, man. I really hate that it's also fined because in my mind, these are not conscious decisions being made. These are subconscious things where people are trying to learn and relearn and relearn how to tackle because every time they tackle, they're told they're doing it wrong because they're hurting people. So then they have to learn all new techniques, and then they learn those techniques, and now if you execute the techniques that you've been taught, you're going to be fined. 
And they're all proud of this because it's like, well, the refs might miss it, but don't worry, we'll get them. Oh, good. So there's going to be bad calls where they're going to have infractions when they didn't do anything wrong. And then sometimes when they do it and it doesn't get called, they're going to get fined later. hi yay yay But then it says, another rule change of note can provide teams with an additional replay challenge. Teams will now have a third challenge if they are successful in one of their first two challenges. You had to be two for two under the previous rule. Look, I'm of the opinion, as long as, you know, you can have like a two strikes rule or something if you want, but as long as you're challenging things and you're getting it right, I don't know why there's a limit. I understand it's like, well, we don't want to slow the pace of the game. Then tell your refs not to suck so much. They're the ones slowing down the game, not not the coaches who are saying, get it right, you moron. There shouldn't be a limit. If, if, if you call a play and I challenge it and the refs are wrong, we move on. There's no need to count that. There's no need to track that. If it happens again and again, I don't care if it happens 50 times in a game. If you keep calling penalties that are wrong, you should be able to keep challenging it. I do understand having a limit because then you would challenge every single one of these. So have a, a, a general rule of two strikes and you're out. But there shouldn't be a limit. If you challenge a second time and you're wrong, then you're, you're, you're seen as sort of abusing the system and now you're no longer able to challenge. The challenges will only come from the, the box, which still should be up there reviewing almost every single reviewable penalty with absolute scrutiny and call down and say, nope, pick up that flag. They got to get it right, man. And they have to be held accountable, and this is just one way to do it. And again, I'm fine with having safeguards to make sure the coaches don't abuse it. But outside of that, there should not be any limits to challenges. The idea that, you know, if the refs are really bad and you challenge like three times and you're right every single time, but you're not allowed to do it anymore because you've already, who gives a crap? He did it three times and all three times he was right because the refs sucked that much and now you're going to take his ability away from him? To correct this group that's obviously been horrible? No. Nope. You keep throwing them until you get to two times you're wrong, then you're done. I don't know why we would protect bad refs, but it's a step in the right direction. So of the three big rule changes that they made, two of them were actually quite good. Um, I mean, one of the kickoff thing we'll see, and, and Mark Murphy talks about it and he brings up some pretty good points. The um, challenge thing is, again, not broad enough but it's moving in the right direction the hip drop tackle thing is just stupid um i mean it's it's still going to be kind of a a a we'll see thing maybe the players are just you know it was something they were doing very consciously and they're just going to stop doing it and it won't be that big of an impact especially when fines are imposed i just don't foresee that being the way that this goes Goes on to say, international play continues to be a top priority for the league Uh, i know a lot of people don't like it i i kind of do um, I love the idea of broadening the fan base. I like the idea of more people being NFL fans, more people being Packers fans. Um, you know, I would, I, for my own selfish sake, I would love to have pe- more people calling in from Brazil. We used to have callers from, I know it's hard to call from, from out of the country, but we had, uh, people from, where was another big one? Was it Sweden? I feel like we had a bunch of fans from Sweden that I used to interact with all the time. Obviously, Canada. Uh, I would love to get some calls from Mexico. You know, the UK, since that's you know a huge thing. Germany now we're expanding into. I just think that's awesome. I love when we get people from other countries calling in. Uh, obviously, there could potentially be a language barrier, but I know English is very broad throughout the world. Uh, most countries do have English as a second or third language. I was just looking at these people from Tunisia, and I was listening to them talk. And it's like, I swear he's saying French words. I don't understand. Like, it's so weird. It's clearly Arabic. But then there's like, I, like, I heard what he said. That was French. Apparently, Tunisia, they do have uh, Arabic and French, and they speak both of them interchangeably. I forgot what the term is called. But then they also have English as a third language. Anyway, I just saw that last night, so I thought I'd mention that. But anyways, I like that. I really do. And I know there's some concern about the strain, but as long as we manage the strain... You know, like they always have an opportunity to get the bye week after, which I think is great. The Packers, I think, elected not to, and I kind of think they regretted not doing it. But also, the more you do it, the more we can kind of evenly distribute it. You know, if you expand it out so you get maybe a second bye week mixed in, 
which I know they're already talking about, continuing to expand how many weeks there are, which would include another bye week, so now you can do more international. Plus, some of these are already brutal, from Seattle to New York or whatever. That's already a, a, a brutal flight. And they got to do that crap all the time. And at, at some level, a long flight is a long flight, you know? And then, and, and you know, how bad is it really? I know it's a long flight, but it's instead of, I mean, how many hours is it from Jacksonville to the UK? I'm going to look that up. It's a 10-hour flight. And that's, that's uncomfortable. I get that. But you know what? You're not getting off the plane and going and playing a football game. You get off the plane, you go to your hotel, you get rested up, right? You go there early. And any competitive disadvantage you would have for additional travel and, and less time to prepare would also be true of the team that you're facing. You'll be fine. Like, freaking suck it up, dude. It's, it's a 10-hour flight. Like, we go to Florida. We sit in the car for like 12 to 16 hours with little kids who are screaming and crying all the time. You're sitting in a plane, listening to music, watching movies, whatever. Like, just whatever, man. <laughs> be all right. Anyways... Currently, the NFL is a top three sport in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, which is fantastic. And again, I would love for Mexico to get more involved. Uh, Canada, too, I suppose. But Mexico is obviously massive, and um, I feel like there's a big untapped market there. Obviously, I know soccer is huge there. Canada doesn't have anything, so it might be good to kind of get into Canada. I mean, they have Canadian football and freaking hockey, and that's about it. Baseball, maybe. I don't know. Goes on to say, the goal is to make the league more popular in additional countries. Uh, this year, there will be five international games, three of three in London. So London's becoming like a very regular thing, which we kind of expected, right? It, it, it does feel like we're moving toward having a London team. So we'll see if there's an expansion. Um, generally, if there is, you don't add just one team because you want there to be like even whatever. I don't know if they'll have like a European uh, group. So it'll be maybe London and, and uh, Germany and freaking or Munich or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what the plan is. Um, uh, do, 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 there will be five games. Uh, so three will be in London, one in Germany, and the first ever game in Brazil, which I think is freaking awesome. Brazil is massive. There's a billion people there. Uh, surprisingly, a big amount of football fans, Packers in particular. Already talked about that. And it says in 2025, there will be eight international games. So this is not, it's, it's, that's the other thing. Like if you hate it, Learn to embrace it because it's going to be a thing. Like, this is not going away. They have 100% committed to this. This is like their biggest thing. It's only going to continue to grow. And there will very likely be an expansion as soon as they can to another country, probably going to be in London. Um, eight international games. Future games could be held in Spain, Mexico, Italy, and Australia, among other countries. The International Player Pathway Program, 17th Practice Squad Player, is also part of the overall strategy. So I like all that. I, it, that's the other thing. It broadens the pool of where we can get players from. We're already seeing people in Africa that are uh, coming over. We had one on our team. There are obviously rugby players, other places and whatnot that have been given some opportunities. You know, the U.S. obviously has some serious athletic freaks, and we have a massive leg up because we have all the training places here. People start very young with football where it doesn't in other places. But the more they assume that they expand that, the more we're going to find athletic freaks in other places. More readily, anyways. I mean, we, we've already got some people in the league that are from other places, but you expand the pool of players. And it also, you know, they're, they're concerned about the pool of players lessening in the United States. Well, you expand that out. Now we have a bigger pool to draw from. The talent goes up, et cetera, et cetera. It also would end up trickling down to th leagues like the UFL or whatever leagues are still alive out there. I have no idea. Because, you know, guys that are now in that league would have been guys that were in the NFL, but now the competition in the NFL is so high, there's better players now in, in that league. All right, the final paragraph before it gets into the question and answer um, is something that I hate. <laughs> he talks about flag football. It's just a freaking curse word. Do not even talk about it, Mark Murphy. I'm serious. Flag football was also highlighted at the meeting. Of course it was. Since 2019, participation in flag football has more than tripled. This helps the NFL not only in, in football participation, many players transition to tackle, but also in fan development. In a growing number of states, girls flag football is now a sanctioned sport. Finally, flag football will be an exhibition sport in the Olympics in LA in 2028. The league hopes it will be a permanent sport in 2032 in the 2032 Olympics. So I get what he's saying. Like This is all just positive. Again, it's about, it's like a gateway drug into the NFL, 
right? Now that we have, for example, obviously the NFL has been reaching out to women very, very hard because it's just, it's an, I don't want to say untapped market, but it's just a, a huge group of people that are not as interested. And if we can get them to become interested, that means we got a lot more money coming in. And so if there is women's flag football, then you have more women playing football. And the more women play football, the more women are interested in football. And the hope is that they become interested in the NFL. Maybe not necessarily playing it, but watching it and, and, and that kind of a thing. Same thing for, you know, for example, if parents don't want their kids playing tackle football, you put them into flag football, they're still interested in football. Some of them maybe become tackle football players. And maybe, again, we're expanding our pool to, to pull into the NFL. Or at the very least, we have more fans. My concern is that if they're successful, let's say the NFL and this flag football entity become very, very successful and it becomes a very popular thing, the NFL will then realize it's it's sort of a, a test group. If we become less and less and less physical, that doesn't mean that we will necessarily lose our fans. Now, I don't think that that's true because I'm not watching flag football. I don't think anyone listening to me wants to watch flag football, but could they possibly move closer and closer and closer to it to the point where we're sort of desensitized and then they make the big jump and we're kind of like, I'm not watching it. And it's like, well, freaking, what else am I going to do? It's Sunday, Packers are on, I got to watch it, right? It just makes me nervous. I, I don't want it. I just, I don't want it to succeed as much as it's like, yeah, expand the pool and all that bull crap. I don't want it to work. I was excited about it when I heard there was going to be a flag football thing in the Olympics and there was going to be, and it, like, just because the USA was just going to dominate everybody. Now I hate it. I don't want it. Go away. I do not want flag football to succeed. I don't want the NFL looking at that going, oh, people like flag football, huh? Nope, we hate it. It's stupid. It's dumb. I'm not watching it. I'm not watching the Olympics. I don't care if freaking Jordan Love and the, and the crew are in the Olympics. I'm at least going to pretend I'm not watching it. I'm going to go to a... a, a Buffalo Wild Wings and watch it there so that it seems as though I'm not watching it on my TV because I don't want them knowing that as far as viewership, I'm interested. I don't want anything to do with flag football, period. Am I being paranoid? Maybe, but I just, I don't like it. We're continually moving in that direction. I feel like the NFL would never do that. And now you got them openly saying, hey, we want to grow flag football. We want it to be a big thing. We want to see how successful it is. Why? No. Oh, no, don't worry about it. We just want to see if we can, like, transition them into to the... Yeah, but what if you want to turn it... I just... Mm, 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 mm. No. Don't like it. Don't like it. Don't like it. Don't want it. Fail, baby, fail. Please fail. Anyways, uh, why don't we take a break? We'll come back. We haven't even gotten to the question and answer portion yet, so that's what we will do. He's going to talk about the kickoff, et cetera, et cetera. And again, he makes some pretty good points. Uh, if you want to support me, you can over at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Otherwise, you can hit me up on Venmo, Packernet Podcast. Um, subscribe or uh, follow me, uh, pack underscore daddy on Twitter. Trying to get that thing revved up, see what that turns into. Of course, Packernet Podcast on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. This spring, make sure you're eating stress-free with Factors' delicious ready-to-eat meals. 
Every single one of Factor's fresh, never frozen meals is chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. Like literally two minutes. You can choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, Vegan, and Veggie. And they've got more than 60 add ons every single week, like breakfast, on the go, lunch, snacks, beverages. So there's nothing to wait for. Get started right away. If you're looking for something gourmet, they've got that too. They got premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccolini, asparagus. I don't even eat that good. It's also going to be tailored to your schedule. You can customize your weekly meals with the flexibility to get as much or as little as you need, pause or reschedule deliveries to suit your lifestyle. So head over to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code packdaddy50 at factor. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. All right, first question says, in last month's column, you wrote about the current state of returns where most kicks boot, uh, boot kickers booted out of the end zone. You wrote that such kicks are, quote, in my mind, nothing is more boring in the game. Can you please explain why you were one of the three votes against the rule that did pass? Moreover, if you could have it your way, what would you propose instead of the one that passed? So Mark Murphy, first of all, wasn't even aware of that, apparently hated kickoffs. It was the dumbest, most boring pile of crap ever. Here's what he says. Sure, Mark, I would be pleased to explain our thought process on the issue. Although the kickoff had become a meaningless play, none of the 13 kickoffs in the Super Bowl returned, and at all-time low, 22% of kicks were returned last season. That's shocking, because the video I saw said less than 40%. That was probably some kind of an average. We were down to 22%. Dude, that sucks real bad. Um, He goes on to say, I didn't think we knew enough about the new rule to justify voting for it. I would have preferred that we use the preseason uh, this year as a trial. We have done this in the past with proposed rule changes. I believe that there may well be unintended consequences with the new rule from both a competitive and safety standpoint. The process seems rushed to me. It also concerns me that the UFL, uh, the merged league with the XFL and the USFL, has a traditional kickoff rather than the XFL rule. So, Very, very good points. The last part in particular is extremely interesting to me. The XFL that developed this thing merged with the USFL, and they both agreed to not use the XFL kickoff. Why? That's a really good point. And so I'm my only objection to it is is that listen, I want it, and I I, it would suck if if they do that in the preseason and it's great and we love it and there's a bunch of kickoffs and then they don't do it in the regular season and we're like man i really wish they did that thing but i i I do think he's right that's just me being impatient i think they should try it i think they should kick the crap out of the ball see how it goes and and just you know number one check for unintended consequences number two see if it's as cool as people think maybe we end up hating it and then we don't have to adopt it it would be very simple to just try it And then we'll reconvene next year and figure it out. Also, I want an answer to that question between the XFL and USFL. I'm sure they have contacts. I'm sure they have phone numbers. Make some calls. Why didn't you do it? So I think that's perfectly fair. I think it's perfectly reasonable. I think he's probably right. As much as I'm, I'm just excited that we just get to watch it now, this may suck and it may have some issues. And then what? Do we go back to our old way of doing it? That's embarrassing. This is just Mark Murphy being the adult in the room saying, guys, we gotta slow down. Like we can test this thing out. So I do think he's right about that. The, the, the thing that I find hilarious is the fact that none of this is ever applied to any other of these rules, especially safety rules. Where was Mark Murphy voting against the hip drop tackle for the exact same reason? Here's what he could have said about voting on the hip drop tackle. I didn't think we knew enough about the new rule to justify voting for it. I would have preferred that we use a preseason to use this as a trial. We have done this in the past with proposed rule changes. I believe that there may well be unintended consequences with the new rule from both a competitive and safety standpoint. The process seemed rushed to me. That exact same logic could be applied to every other rule change. 
and should be, by the way. Again, I will concede, as much as I want this change to happen, I will concede he's probably right. But he's right about the hip drop tackle, too. The the evidence of that is that the hip drop tackle is an unintended consequence of changing the tackling rules prior to that. Maybe, and again, I understand it's a safety thing, so they're just saying, like, we, we can't justify, you know, can you imagine not actually implementing it and just trying it in the preseason? And what are we actually going to see in the preseason anyways? Did we actually help people or whatever? And then, um, and then the injuries start piling up because of hip drop tackles and we can't do anything. We can't da 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 I mean, it, it, do, it doesn't matter. I, I just, I think that that rationale right there should be applied to every rule change. Just try it first. Just slow down. Let's think about this. Let's work through this a little bit. Before we completely, radically overhaul what the NFL has done for 100 years and rush into something, let's slow down. (laughs) Just slow down. And again, we need an answer. And Mark Murphy apparently doesn't know what the answer is. I want an answer on the XFL-USFL thing. Because that's massive to me. Unless unless they just have this notion of we're going to be the physical league and let the NFL be the soft league. In other words, we're going to do a traditional kickoff, not what the NFL was doing prior. If they're, if they're doing what the NFL did prior, where everything just kicked, kicked out of the end zone, then that's a little concerning. If they're going back to the original kickoff, then I, I, I'm not as concerned about it. They're just saying, screw you and, and this safety crap. We're just doing real, live, big boy football kickoffs. That's that's what I want to know. In fact, maybe I could look it up. Uh, what what the heck is this? UFL? Here's what, uh, just a little snippet here. It says, um, during negotiations to merge the two leagues' rule books, UFL officials decided to retain the USFL version that closely resembles the traditional NFL kickoff. Yeah, but which one are we talking about? In the UFL version, the kicker will spot the ball at the 20-yard line, all but eliminating the chance of a touchback. Okay, so they're going back to the old school kickoffs. So, th- so this is not really necessarily a big concern. They don't need the XFL rule because the XFL is sort of a compromise to make sure that we're, we prioritize safety, but also make sure that there's still kickoffs. The UFL is saying, okay, we're not freaking worried about just screw it. We're just going back to the 20 and doing kickoffs. It says, uh, all but eliminating the chance of a touchback and thus maximizing the number of returns. A kickoff that goes out of bounds will be spotted at the 30-yard line uh, where the ball left the field. No, it will be spotted 30 yards from where the ball left the field. So if it goes out of the 20, they get it at the 50? That's wild. In a twist of irony, the XFL's version, which places most players downfield and requires them to stand still until the ball hits the ground or is fielded, was the basis for a proposed revamp of the NFL's kickoff, which was approved at the owners' meeting early this week. Johnson previously said the USFL's injury data wasn't much different than the XFL's, and Blandino said there is nothing preventing the league from adjusting after the 2024 season. It's not like we can't get through the 2024 work backward toward more of an XFL. So so they're going to try the old school style kickoffs. And if there's a bunch of injuries, they'll just do the XFL. But in the meantime, they're just going to do regular old kickoffs. So if you kind of miss that, we can go back and watch the UF. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's making me want to watch it, to be honest. By the way, uh, the rule that I freaking hate, that I think people are very split on it, but it says the quote-unquote worst rule in football won't exist. I'm just just out of curiosity, some of their rules. If an offensive player fumbles the ball into and out of the end zone, the offense will retain the position at the spot of the fumble. That is consistent with the USFL and XFL rules in 2023, but contrary to the way the NFL handles it, Quote, we only had it once last year, Blandino said. Whenever that happens in the NFL, there's a narrative of it being the worst rule in football. People hate it, and so we felt like we want to listen to our fans. It doesn't happen that often, so we've implemented that. We'll, uh, we'll implement that and see how it goes. Again, I this is why I want this league to succeed, because they're going to change things, and the NFL is watching, and it's just hopefully pushing the NFL in a good direction. Um, I don't know that this is necessarily my favorite option in terms of how to handle it, but it's better than what the NFL is doing. Anyways, let's move on to the next question. Jeffrey in Eveleth, Minnesota says, Hello, Mark Murphy. I'm wondering about your role on draft days. Do you spend the days in the draft room with your staff? Do you give any input or opinions on the players being selected? Or do you let your staff take on this responsibility? Just curious how this plays out. Thanks for all you have done for our great Packers team. He says, great question, Jeffrey. I am in the draft room all three days, but I do not provide any input or opinions on players. Brian Gutekunst and his staff spend a lot of time preparing for the draft, and I view my role as mainly being to support them. 
It is fascinating to see how all the time and effort they have put in comes together. I'm excited for this year's draft. We should be able to really help ourselves with five picks in the top 100. So, I mean, I I think most of us probably kind of knew this. It's good to get some kind of a confirmation. I'm guessing this is exactly what we would want. But just kind of two minor points on this, um, sort of no-brainers, but I'll say it anyways. Number one, this is the benefit of not having an owner. I, I, I guarantee you this is one of the few people in that position, in other words, him plus all the owners, that has no input. That does not have any kind of, hey, I like this guy. They're they're in there. You know, you you know, even though they take sort of a, a lesser role, they're in there. They're talking about, hey, what about that quarterback? What about that wide receiver? What do we think about him? Are you sure? You know what I mean? Like they're 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 pushing and prodding. Mark Murphy's looking at it going, I, I got nothing to say. You got nothing to do with me. I'm just hanging out having a good time supporting my boys, man. I'm like, hey man, great, great pick. Never heard of that freaking guy. Great pick. Love him. Can't wait to get him in here. And I know some people may not like that, but let me just reiterate that is a good thing. The bottom line is, and this is sort of my second point, everybody has a role. And Brian Gutekunst's role is to find the talent and put him on the team. If you don't trust him to do it, you need to find somebody else. You should not be poking and prodding. Your input is only as much as he asks you to input. So if he goes to Matt LaFleur and asks him for input, which he does, then you provide him that input because it's going to help him make his decision. Outside of that, you don't step on anybody's toes. This is that whole silos thing, and it's how it should be. Brian Gutekunst doesn't tell Matt LaFleur how to coach. Matt LaFleur doesn't tell Brian Gutekunst who to draft. And that's where, again, Aaron Rodgers was very wrong. This is a very understood thing. We have a process. We have a system. We have a way of doing things here, and it's a very successful way of doing things. You're the quarterback. You do not come in here and tell me how to do my freaking job. He overstepped. And the fact that Mark Murphy won't even do that, but Aaron Rodgers will wildly unacceptable sort of continuing on with that a couple questions down luke from virginia beach virginia says when you're looking at players in free agency what is it that you and brian look for most besides team fit he answers the question i've been very pleased with the way brian has handled free agency during his tenure as general manager the nfl draft is uh the most important way to improve the team but free agency can be a great compliment as well i love that he's just a packers guy i mean that's such a packers (laughs) like you get a free agency question and he talks about the draft. What do you guys think about free agency? Yeah, I mean, look, the draft is the most important thing. Uh, but, you know, free agency is it's a thing. But we love, you know, the draft is where it's at, man. He says, I think this year's two big swings, Josh Jacobs and Xavier McKinney, are good examples of what we look for in free agents. They're both young, ascending players. We also look for players who have high character and are leaders. It's impressive that both Josh and Xavier were captains on their team, given how young they are. I'm confident that both Josh and Xavier will have a big impact on the team this year. To be clear, when he says we, he's not answering the question saying me and and uh, Goot when we get guys. He's talking about we as a team, what we as an entity look for in people to bring into this organization. But that's an understood component that is permeated throughout, from Mark Murphy to Brian Gutekunst to Matt LaFleur, et cetera, et cetera. But he answered the question of who in the beginning when he says the way Brian has handled free agency. Brian Gutekunst is the one doing this, and he is doing it in the Packers way that we as a Packers organization look for. And we are all in agreement on that. So that's he's so he's answering the question. What are we looking for? Young ascending players, which again, I'm shocked that the Packers seem to be the only team that are really I mean, they're they will go all in for these type of players. Because this is it's like drafting a guy. Except you don't get him on his rookie contract. Who cares? You draft a guy and you nail it and then you give him the contract. That's a good thing. These guys drafted somebody, they nailed it, and they're going to let him hit free agency. And the Packers are like, this is like cheating. We can pretend that we got our guy, the running back and the safety in the the draft. We'll just give them the contract as though they've been here the whole time. Like, there you go. Congrats. While everybody out there is paying 32-year-old wide... Freaking Bears are paying, what, a 32-year-old wide receiver? You bunch of idiots. I just, I don't understand. I mean, where where were the Lions on Xavier McKinney? Where were the Bears? You, you lost your safety. You could have replaced them with Xavier McKinney. The Vikings with your new um, your new defensive coordinator. The defense is a disaster. I mean, granted, you need more than a safety, but any, any one of you guys could have absolutely benefited from him. You let the Packers get him? What is wrong with you? And you're out there looking for 30-year-olds to just kind of help us through another year. Bro, Aside from the Lions, nobody is at that point yet. And even the Lions shouldn't be looking at that. 
like we're one player away. It's nonsense. Probably the only two really young, really gifted players, and the Packers got both of them. And everybody's out there talking about, oh, the Packers did the least in free agency. You, you get frickin' bent, you bunch of morons. You're all so stupid. Look what the Bears did. They got Keenan Allen. <laughs> it's stupid. It's not quite as stupid as the frickin' linebacker that they got, because Keenan Allen's he's pretty dope, and he, who knows, he could play for maybe two, three more years, and he's probably going to be really good with the Bears, and it's going to look like a good thing as opposed to uh, what's-his-nuts that sucks at football. But still, stupid, stupid, stupid. I'll answer the final question, too. It, it's, again, not very big, but there's one part in there that just makes me giggle. The question is very long. I'm not going to read it all, but it's it's uh, Carrie V. Um, talks about the overtime and how it's weird that, the, like, regular season and postseason, they have different rules. And then says, the rules of overtime should be, number one, both teams have a chance to possess the ball. Number two, if the team who possesses the ball first in overtime scores a touchdown, they may only kick an extra point. A two-point conversion is not an option. And then rule three, a trailing or tied team must always try to be scoring more than the team who previously possessed the ball. Uh, for example, if they scored a field goal, you must score a touchdown. If they scored a touchdown and had to kick an extra point, you have to score a touchdown and a two-point conversion. It's not a terrible thought, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, uh, we'll skip the rest of it. And Mark Murphy says, thanks for the thoughtful proposal, Kerry. Um, I think you raised some good points. The reason the NFL overtime rules are different in the regular season and postseason is because obviously you can't have a tie in the postseason. That's obvious. Also, on top of that, you can't have multiple overtimes in the regular season because there's other games going on. And in the postseason, there's nothing else going on today. This is it. And uh, we need to have a winner. Your proposal would certainly make for some exciting games. When I was at Colgate, I was on the IAA committee that adopted the current college overtime rules. I think it makes some uh, for some exciting games, but unlike the NFL rule, there's very little special teams play. This is my favorite part. As you note, the overtime rules put more weight on the coach's decisions. I know Kyle Shanahan was questioned for deciding to receive the kick in overtime in the Super Bowl. Conventional wisdom is that you're better off kicking off and going second on offense because you know what you have to do to win and will go for it on fourth since you have nothing to lose. Those are tough decisions for coaches, and they will always be second-guessed when they lose. Just for no reason at all throws Kyle Shanahan under the bus. I freaking love it. Yeah, uh, the way we do it now has more to do with coaches. You know, it, it's, uh, it's about good coaching. And, you know, for example, Kyle Shanahan, he's an idiot, uh, and that's why they lost. So, anyways... You know, it's tough. It's tough being a coach. Frickin' 49er idiots. Uh, It just is what it is sometimes. Sucks to suck, I guess. Oh, Marky. I love Mark Murphy, man. I tell you what, there there, there are a lot of, you know, there's maybe a handful of people not on the Matt LaFleur train. There's a bunch of people that don't like Goot, and then a huge pile of people that don't like Mark Murphy. I don't know how you can like him. He's the most likable guy in the world. It is so much more fun being me. It just is. I'm not saying you have to agree with every decision. I don't agree with every decision that they make. But not only liking the team, but the players and the coaches and the GM and the 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 president rooting for them, being excited. You know, it's just it's just it's just better than than what you got going on over there. Being pissed off all the time. I'm just saying try it. You don't have to do it publicly because I know like it's it's a big tough manly thing you got going on with the whole freaking idiot. Big strong tough guy stuff, but um, just try it in private, you know, privately appreciate people and be grateful and thankful to people and, and see how it feels. Maybe you like it. And if you don't, you just go back to being angry again. It'll always be an option just sitting there for you. I'm just saying, just try it out, man. Who knows? Anyways, let's take our final break. Hang in there, folks. We're almost through it. I know, I know I'm making you suffer. Back and I want to take a look real quick at some of the visits the Packers have had with some of the draft prospects. We'll be right back. It's only a kick, a jump, a block, it's only a serve, it's only a tackle, a run, it's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. So there's a pretty cool thing here. Uh, Kent Wayrock. I don't know. There's people that just put together some cool stuff, man. But KentWayrock.com, he's got this NFL draft visits thing. It's pretty dope because it just puts together a chart 
that shows, you know, the visits and how many for each position and whatnot. Um, the Packers have had three visits with linebacker, three visits with safeties, two with quarterback, running back, one with uh, interior offensive line, one corner, one defensive tackle, one wide receiver. This is confirmed reports that at least he's aware of. The data actually comes from Walter Football, which I really, really like these guys. Uh, actually, somewhat passively worked with Walter at one point. Technically, we were in the same network and that all kind of fell apart. But um, I've always been an admirer of his from afar for a very, very long time. Long before I even got into the draft, I knew about Walter Football. They just recently changed their website, too. It's more modern, finally. They've been using such an archaic-looking stupid thing. But anyways, they've got uh, different combine meetings and top 30 uh, visits, which again is all in this nice little chart, but I just wanted to point this out real quick because I just checked it out. Over at Walter Football, they have a Senior Bowl meeting, East-West Shrine meeting, Combine meetings. Um, then they've also got interested, very interested, pro day or campus workout, local visits, top 30 private visits, private workouts, or some type of meeting or virtual meeting. So they, they've really expanded. The, the cool thing, though, is interested and very interested. So these are kind of like insight things. I want to start adding that stuff to things that I do. I, I've been trying to figure out how to organize notes so that as I move forward, I can kind of have all this stuff. But anyways, there's no interested or very interested for the Packers yet at this point. Um, getting back to my handy dandy little chart here. The um, visits at the combine were running back Jonathan Brooks, jacked, running back Audric Estime, whatever, quarterback Bo Nix, because again, quarterbacks are on the board. <laughs> It's not impossible. Quarterback Michael Pratt. By the way, the two quarterbacks that are not super early that I like, two of my favorite, Michael uh, Michael Pratt and Bo Nix. Love those guys. Uh, safety Evan Williams. Wide receiver Xavier Worthy. Private top 30 workout so far that they've had one-on-one -on -one time with these guys. Christian Boyd, the defensive tackle. Edgerin Cooper, the linebacker. Love it. Chris Edmonds, the safety. Tyron Hopper, the linebacker. Jerry and Jones corner, Katan Oladapo safety, somebody's uh, favorite. It's uh, actually mine. Nobody else likes him. Inside joke. Trevin Wallace linebacker and Zach Zinter interior offensive line. So just real quick, um, I understand that it doesn't mean we're going to draft these guys. Essentially what it means is these are guys that they want to get some more information on. Maybe they have some discrepancies in, in the building. In other words, some people like them, some people don't could be injury related like with Jonathan Brooks like we want to see if he can still move do this that or the other have our doctors kind of take a closer look at him could be some off field issues they want to they want to get to know their personality because there's some questions um the bottom line is they use these visits to help shore up their board to make sure that the board is correct still i want to take a quick look at these guys so if we look at these guys, I'm not going to go super in-depth because we're not super in time and it's not really worth it at this point. We will at some point, uh, like I said, when we go through all the prospects. The one thing, by the way, that gets me excited is that every single one of these is in the top 200 except for two of them, which is I've expanded to the top 200 of all the, the guys I want to watch. If I have time, I'll expand it out to 250 and then I'll get basically all of them in here. Um, one of them is not on the NFL big board at all. Chris Edmonds. Don't know who that is. Um, Arizona state, apparently he's, uh, there are two players from Arizona state on this big board, by the way, it goes to, this is the NFL mock draft database or whatever. They have 622 prospects and Chris Edmonds is not on that list. Anyways, uh, starting with the highest on the consensus big board list, Bo Nix, the quarterback at 32, um, I, I don't know. I mean, again, this is mostly about setting your board and finding out where guys go. I'm trying to think of a scenario, though, in which this makes a ton of sense, and I'm not really seeing it. Presumably, you're looking in the second round. If Bonix is there, would we consider drafting him, developing him, and seeing where it goes? You know, the Packers love quarterbacks and all that. I just, that seems scary to me. Um, the next highest is Xavier Worthy at 35. So Xavier Worthy is, I mean, if you're looking for speed, this is speed. 4-2-1, 40-yard dash. He's a freaking speed demon. Big-time playmaker. You know, if you're looking again to kind of go that Miami Dolphins model, of just making everybody ridiculously fast, slash, you know, Christian Watson replacement if that doesn't super work. 
making sure this team has elite speed. I don't see why Matt LaFleur wouldn't do it. Um, again, you're, you're kind of just getting into the realm of we have so many wide receivers, but it's just mix and match. Like we don't have this elite number one and then your number two and then your slot guy. It's just, we got our slot guy and then we got a bunch of other groupings that we can put out there depending on what we're trying to do. Plus we can cover our bases in the case of injury. If Christian Watson goes down, we don't lose speed. We have Xavier Worthy. I'm not saying they're doing it. I'm just going through the rationale that I would go through if we were to draft them. Next up, uh, currently consensus 42 is Edger and Cooper. Um, again, I'll, I'll go more in depth on it when we actually cover these, but um, when I went through, I had a lot of similar thoughts. I changed my position on, um, now I don't remember his name, Eichenberg, a little bit, insofar as his role, but I still really like him. But Edger and Cooper is now my favorite linebacker. Um, I didn't care for him at first. I didn't like the top two linebackers. I still am not a huge fan of Peyton Wilson, but Edron Cooper, I'm a huge fan of. Um, I would be all about that. First round, I mean, okay, fine. But ideally, this is, if they were to draft him, it would be one of our second round picks. And I'd be pretty excited about that. Next at consensus 54. And by the way, those are the only three in the top 50 that they looked at. At 54, Jonathan Brooks. Again, presumably this has to do a lot with his injuries and whatnot but getting him into workout. He was uh, combine. The only private workout so far of the guys that we've talked about is Edger and Cooper in their top 30. Jonathan Brooks was at the combine. They talked with him a little bit. Again, huge fan of Jonathan Brooks. I love the way that that guy moves. I love the way that that guy plays. Um, then you go all the way down to 109. So we're, we're outside of the top 100 now. You get Audric Estime running back out of Notre Dame. Again, we'll see if I change my opinion on him. The first look through, he was like my least favorite running back. It was just, it was so... Like, his mobility is pathetic. <laughs> like, in a straight line, he's kind of a beast. And yeah, he doesn't, like, unlike A.J. Dillon, he's, he's, he doesn't really fall. Like, he's, he's, he's pretty good uh, contact balance, whatever you want to call it. But man, you try to get him to make a cut or something like this. It's just, it is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. At 113, you got Zach Zinter out of Michigan. He's a pretty popular prospect for the Packers. Good interior guy. Played for a good program. Packers seem to like that, right? That's where we got Josh Myers out of. We got uh, uh, um, uh, Runyon, I think, was also out of Michigan. Getting those Big Ten offensive linemen. Good pass blocker, et cetera, et cetera. That was also a private top 30 meeting. Uh, Jerry and Jones, cornerback out of Florida State, is at 118. Not a very familiar name. Six foot 190, slightly undersized. You know, he's not like a 6'2", 210 guy. Michael Pratt. Um, again, my whole thing with quarterbacks this time around, as I said, because of Aaron Rodgers, because of Jordan Love, because of Justin Fields, all three of them for one reason or another, my main focus was on things like anticipation. It's not just, can you throw the ball accurately? It's not just, can you throw the ball accurately into the right guy? It's, can you throw the ball accurately on time and in rhythm? Because Justin Fields had the first two, not the, not the third, and he busted out of the NFL. Right, he he eventually got to the right guy too late, and I I keep coming back to that thing with Jordan Love against the Eagles, that that first kind of outing that he had, that throw to Christian Watson across the middle. Everybody, oh, it's, all he do was dump it off to him, and Watson did the rest. Okay, fair enough. But that ball was coming out before he even got into his break. He was able to identify based on the defense who he was going to be throwing it to, and then he threw with so much anticipation it was just trust. I'm going to throw it right there, and I'm going to trust that. Christian Watson's going to come out of his break. He's going to run and he's going to catch that thing in stride. And my eyes are going to keep this linebacker frozen. It's that kind of stuff. And, and one of the few guys I saw doing that consistently was Michael Pratt. Now, is there more to being a quarterback than that? Yes. But if you can do that, I like what you're doing. If you can't, I didn't like it. All the other stuff was kind of extra. You know, the, the mobility, can you run? Can you throw sidearm? Can you do all the cool stuff? That's great. But on a play-to-play -play basis, you have to be able to execute the offense. The rest of it is just, it's just fluff. You know, the Pat Mahomes thing is, it's 95% that he's like Tom Brady, right? He does, he, he throws to the right guy on time in rhythm. But we see the flashy stuff and we think that's what makes him elite. No, that's just what takes him over the top. He's able to execute 90% of the time, but then when situations where most people can't, he finds a way. He uses his athleticism and his crazy arm angles and everything else to make that one play. So it's just, he's already great and that makes him greater. But just give me that guy that can do the Tom Brady thing. And if you happen to have the extra steps, great. But you can you can do all the crazy stuff in the world. If you can't execute 90% of the offense, which is just stand in the pocket and make a throw, 
you suck. And I don't care how fast you run or what kind of arm strength you have or what kind of angles you can throw from. Actually, fairly popular prospect, linebacker out of Kentucky. I do like Trevin Wallace. He is consensus 138. This is one of their top 30 meetings. Christian Boyd, the defensive tackle out of Northern Iowa, was a top 30 meeting. He's consensus 153. He's a pretty big dude. I would guess he's on the the high end for the Packers. He's at um, maybe a TJ Slayton replacement potentially, but um, six foot four, 317 pounds. Dude did 38 reps on the bench. (laughs) 38. Good Lord. That was at his pro day, but still, that's wild. But uh, PFF has him 140. Mock draft database 149 is the consensus. Uh, Draft Buzz has him 179. ESPN really doesn't like him, has him at 245, but he should be in the top 200 for me to get a look at him. I'm excited to do that because you got this guy that is in like the 90th percentile in weight and like the 99th percentile in bench. That just sounds like a guy I'm going to appreciate. But it sounds like he's just one of those guys that is pure raw power. And I usually don't end up liking him, but but to some degree, I, I really appreciate him. They're simply just a bull rush right up the middle. Just grab the offensive line, push them straight back. If I got to do anything else, I'm in trouble, but I can do that. Then we got Oladapo, safety out of Oregon State. 6'2", 216, big dude. Um, one of the more uh, liked candidates to be opposite Xavier McKinney, to be more of the downhill, smash you in the mouth guys. He's built for it. Um, he's kind of a slot nickel safety guy. So that also could kind of work out. You can kind of move him around a little bit. Not afraid of contact. One of the negatives is he he kind of draws a lot of flags. <laughs> he's a pretty physical guy. He's very hitty and grabby. But um, some of the differences in rankings. So again, mock draft database, he's at 177. ESPN, again, not super favorite, 180. PFF really doesn't like him, has him at 259. Yikes. Uh, draft buzz has him at 155, though. NFL.com, 97. 33rd team has him at 65. So again, th- these are the kind of wild things that that happen to where the Packers could take a guy like Oladapo, who's like a consensus, I don't even know, like fourth round, fifth round even maybe, could kind of on the verge there. I'm not sure if it is. You take him like with your second, second round pick, and it's like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> but 33rd team's like, that's great value right there. Then you got Tyron or Tyrone Hopper, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, linebacker out of Missouri, 6'2", 231. Pretty fast, runs a four five forty. Sounds like a, a pretty good developmental prospect who's got some athleticism and some you know fluidity, mobility type of things, but might need some refinement specifically with tackling. So one of the notes is he's kind of a grab and drag tackler, which is one of the worst things you can be with this change of the hip drop tackle. <laughs> so he's got to got to figure that one out. Um, he's mostly consensus around two hundred PFF two hundred nine ESPN two hundred one NFL dot com one ninety five. Mock Draft Database, 186. Draft Buzz, 181. But a couple organizations really like him. CBS has him 96th, and Pro Football Network has him 64th. Evan Williams, the safety out of uh, Oregon. 5'11", 200 pounds. Sounds kind of similar to Oladapo insofar as he's pretty good around the line of scrimmage. He's good coming downhill. He's a guy that you can pack some muscle on. He's got a bigger frame than than what he's supporting right now. So he's maybe like an Oladapo light. Um, some of his rankings, NFL.com 264, Mock Draft Database Consensus 217. I think that's old. I just looked at it. It's 241 right now, so he's dropping. Draft Buzz 216. CBS, though, loves him. 63. Uh, 63. Then finally, we got Chris Edmonds, the safety that doesn't exist on Mock Draft Database. Also does not exist on uh, Draft Buzz, NFL Draft Buzz, which, by the way, fantastic. I don't know where Draft Buzz came from. I, I'm, I've been doing this every single year. I've got these go-to sites that you see. All of a sudden, there's Draft Buzz, and it's like, these guys, they got their stuff put together, man. This is one of the better, if not the best, sites for the draft right now. <laughs> it's just, as far as like what I'm looking for, which is, you know, just give me the bullet points. I mean, this is literally just every piece of data I could want, all in bullet points. And they got the the stats and the workout combines. They got the player news over here. It's just like, what the heck, dude? But anyways, I can't tell you much about Mr. Chris Edmonds. We could go over to PFF, but, you know, whatever. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if his name kind of comes up. That's that's more than likely going to be a uh, 
one of their seventh round kind of who the heck is that guy or an undrafted free agent or whatever. I don't know, but they have questions for whatever reason, but I'm going to leave it at that. You guys have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you tonight, tomorrow, whatever. As of right now, I don't have, well, you would have known. Oh, wait, we got a bunch of calls that came in. We'll see. I don't know if there's going to be Packernet after dark. So make sure, or I don't know if there was one last night for you, but make sure you get your calls in because we're kind of, kind of lacking a little bit. Anyways, thank you guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.